Nothing brightens a dark room like light from a window. Time to open the window. Oh, no! Why? Why is this happening? Ah! Surprise! Ah! My eyes are on fire! Ah! 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 Yep, it's finally June. So that means it's LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Although, I'm not technically a part of this community. At most, I am an ally to those who are part of it. However, this whole thing about Pride has got me thinking about the idea of representation. Specifically when it comes to the media we watch. Lots of shows and movies nowadays include minority representation in some form. Just to be clear, when I say minority, I mean either LGBTQ+, neurodivergence, and or ethnic slash racial minorities. For the longest time, I never took representation seriously when it comes to shows and movies. Usually whenever I find out that a character is part of a minority group, I take a mostly agnostic stance on it. I obviously don't hate the story for having a minority character, but I'm not going to be overly cheery about it. That's because with a lot of these stories, representation is usually a nice add-on to the show or movie that does not have to be there in order to make the story work. However, both Amphibia and the Owl House proved to me that representation in cartoons can indeed be important to a show in more ways than one, and that is actually beneficial. Both shows manage to illustrate representation in a way that feels right given their themes. They have all three forms of minority representation I mentioned earlier. However, Amphibia focuses a lot more on ethnicity and racial minority representation, while The Owl House focuses a lot more on LGBTQ plus representation. As for neurodivergence representation, that topic will get a video for another time. But when it comes to queer and ethnic representation, The Owl House and Amphibia do both respective forms of rep incredibly well. The Owl House in particular is especially praised for its queer representation, and for good reason. There's no other cartoon, particularly within Disney, where much of the main cast of characters are confirmed to be LGBTQ+. Luz is the first main character of a Disney cartoon to be openly bisexual, Amity is confirmed to be a lesbian, and Luz and Amity are the first ever LGBTQ plus couple in a Disney cartoon. Side note, technically speaking, Gravity Falls was actually the first Disney cartoon to show a same-sex couple on screen with Sheriff Blubs and Deputy Durlin, but their romantic relationship was more implied, while Luz and Amity were it's indisputably romantic. Anyways, other queer characters of the Owl House also include Ida, who expressed romantic feelings for a non-binary character, Rain Whispers. In fact, the voice behind Rain, Avi Roque, is transgender and non-binary, and the character is largely based on their real-life experiences. In the Season 3 special, thanks to them, Masha, one of the human side characters of the show, is confirmed to use the pronouns they them, meaning they are also non-binary. In the series finale, Papa Titan reveals he's genderqueer, after he says, I am both king and queen, best of both things. <laughs> then in multiple live streams, Dana Terrace confirms that Lilith is aromantic and asexual, or arrow ace as some people call it, and she confirms that Hunter is bisexual and Willow is pansexual. Now admittedly, some people might view all of this queer representation in the Owl House as a bit overboard. Do we need this many characters of the show to be queer? While you might not need it to make the Owl House's story work, it's necessary to do one thing, which is to make queerness acceptable in the eyes of the masses. By having many of the characters be queer and act relatively like what you expect from real people, it makes it clear to the audience that queerness is perfectly fine, so they should be free to express it. Of course, it's not just the Owl House that goes out of its way to have LGBTQ representation. Amphibia has its fair share of queer characters and couples as well. Sasha Waybright, one of the show's major characters, is confirmed to be bisexual by the end of the series. Olivia Nunan and Ali and Jess are two confirmed same-sex couples in the show. Terry is likely to be a non-binary character, although their gender is a bit ambiguous. Then of course there's Mr. X, who is voiced and looks like RuPaul, and we all know that RuPaul is a queer person. Like its sister show, Amphibia openly shows these types of relationships and sexualities as if they are normal, which is key because it tells the audience of the show, most of whom are kids, that queerness is perfectly acceptable in modern society. It's not something that people have to hide. Of course, I'm willing to concede that Amphibia's queer representation is not as vast compared to the Owl House. However, it makes up for that in how it does ethnic slash racial representation, particularly Asian American representation. Personally, as someone who is Asian American, I relate to this a lot more, which again adds to why I prefer one show over the other. But objectively speaking, both forms of rep are just as important. Like I mentioned before, when a show or movie has minority representation, it's usually done in a way that is discreet. The characters will appear to be born of a certain race, ethnicity, and or sexuality, but it usually does not have much of an impact on the show's story. That's how Amphibian and the Owl House largely approach queer representation, and it works well given the context. 
But what makes Amphibia more exceptional in terms of ethnic slash racial representation is how it is integral to the show's narrative. Now some stories that I've read and watched don't really include that because doing so can actually harm a story's narrative, which can be seen in one show that I absolutely despise so much that I refuse to name it. But Amphibia managed to pull it off the correct way, and most of it is largely due to the show's premise. When you boil down what Anne's story is, it's basically the story of an immigrant. She finds herself in a very alien environment and she struggles a lot to adapt to her new world. However, thanks to the local community she found, she grew to love the place. She did so by adopting a lot of Amphibia's unique quirks and sticking to the memory of her old home and customs. Now some people I know have a hard time understanding how a show about a girl being trapped in a frog world can be relatable to people like me, but Anne's Thai American background makes an outlandishly unrealistic story seem realistic in some ways. None of us can relate to being trapped in a world full of talking frogs, but many of us can relate to being an immigrant. In addition, Anne's Thai background plays a major role in the narrative of the first half of season 3. In multiple episodes in this season, we see how Anne's parents, despite living in LA for decades, still do not feel like they're fully accepted into American society. At least that was the case until the Boone Choice finally made their way into the annual Christmas parade. To complete that analogy, Anne realizes that her experiences in Amphibia is comparable to her mom's experience living in the US. Wow, I never knew you and dad felt that way. And after months in Wartwood, I know what it's like feeling out of place. <laughs> Overall, what makes representation in Amphibia, The Owl House, and a bunch of other shows and movies important is it gives a perspective of life that not everyone will or can experience on their own. While I experience what life is like for an ethnic minority basically every day, the majority of people cannot do that without hearing stories like these. Likewise, the same thing can be said about queer representation. While I cannot relate to it that well, it gives me and others a perspective of how life might be for those who are in that community. So as much as I and others try not to care much about representation in a show or movie and focus solely on the plot, the lore, and other deeper aspects of a story, representation will always be important to people and it should be celebrated whenever possible, whether it be Asian American Heritage Month, LGBTQ Pride Month, or any month throughout the year. But yeah, those are just my thoughts on representation in these cartoons. Let me know what you guys think about representation in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content like this. Also, thanks again to Seb Maida for your direct support through Patreon. And shout out to Calamity Music who created most of the music that I use for my videos. Given that it's Pride Month, I feel like it's right that I give major credit to LGBTQ content creators like her. If you somehow have not checked out her channel yet, the link to it will be in the description below. Anyways, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. I hope you all have a great day. See you in the next one.